You know, I teach now at Columbia College, which is an arts, media, and performance school. Uh, visual people who have to write term papers. It's painful for me. But I get some good students, so some. But I say to them, without joking, but they laugh, nobody gets an A here unless I learn something from you. I go, huh? <laughs> well, they grew up, and you have, in a different era than I did. And different things happen. So, I remember one student uh, who really had great questions. He said, how do you go to a museum? I don't know. You know, I said, well, um, he said, I asked because we grew up uh, playing video games and watching movies. We didn't read books or go to museums. I said, oh boy, I have to learn to teach differently. 
So I teach mostly history of photography. And so all these uh, old pictures are new to them. The new, I don't have it to show. The very first one that it ever succeeded is this interesting, strange picture. And I go on and on and on about the prosthesis and how the absolute invented it. And he and his brother had invented the first internal combustion engine, you know? And then they invented photography. That, that, that's GM and Kodak all together. So they didn't capitalize on any of that. But after I was done, so some, one of my students said, um, you didn't talk about uh, that as a picture. I said, you didn't know he was going to get a picture. Well, I wanted to know about the architect. I said, they're probably 16th century uh, French buildings in a courtyard, you know. I, I don't, I don't. She said, no, the one in the picture. <coughs> I said, I don't see an architect. Well, there was a big slanted roof and some trees kind of nebulously back there. And when you looked at it then, it looked exactly like an architect at a drafting table like this. And I said, oh my God, I've been looking at this for 40 years. All of my colleagues said, no one has ever mentioned there's a guy in there. <laughs> and you can't unsee it. <laughs> so the next class, I did a similar thing. And I said, so I know you haven't seen it. Look at it. What do you see? And the first guy in the front row said, who's the guy? I said, see, I, it's invisible to me. So the smartest person in my field is a good friend of mine. He said, oh, David, that's because you only know what you, you only see what you know. And I said, whoa. So how would you start seeing things you didn't know visually, not as subjects in the picture? How would you reinvent a picture of them? He said, well, you know, we know how we learn academically. I'm sure you're right in the middle of that, right? And how you continue doing that. All right, fine. It's fine. We just read. What about music? How do you get a melody? I mean, I'm a good audience, but I'm not a musician, right? So that's a mystery, right? Same with visual things. Same with being a good cook. I mean, how do you invent a recipe? Well, so that's I went on a voyage of discovery. I'll give you a little a preamble here. Uh, this is one of my pictures I've been taking on the lakefront. You might notice it's upside down. It's way better that way. <laughs> uh, there's a whole history unwritten in the history of photography about the upside down picture. I'll do it someday. So I teach at Columbia, and I go there. And while I was going there, uh, just before class, this was the scene uh, out in the front. There were wonderful shadows and highlights that sharded all over this, uh, the sidewalk from various windows as the sun glanced off of it. So I first thing I learned, of, and you know, I photographed for since I was in the room. Uh, first thing I learned. Of, Columbia is, I'm getting always too close. I, I need a wider angle. Yeah. So now with our, our cell phones, this is not a cell phone picture. Uh, we have a wide angle in there. And so when you look at that, you see the picture. But that's not your whole wide angle vision. It's very hard to see in a very wide angle vision. So you see a little picture that helps. So the other thing I learned, is, not particularly at Columbia, is the bottom is always more important uh, if you flip it upside down than the top, because the top, your eye goes to the space. And then, you know, it's still there. But now, look what the picture is about. It's about the light. So I said, I'm going to follow light. That's going to be my primary subject. It's good for photography, right? Well, uh, look at this. <laughs> There's the shadows. Now, I noticed people walking. Now, I had never seen this, except in my bridge or something, or a nice walking, you know. Look at these businessmen. They're going to the Hilton. They are in total stuff. No one can match this. Look at the heels. This is not even And I love this woman say, oh, for I'm going to do a lot. You know, I thought, what is this? So I got this analytical group up to the side. 
Um, well, the students are not too bad at it. They uh, kind of you got to stand out there a long time to get into it. it. When people are walking down the street together, and you'll see this later in the future, um, they end up going inside. Uh, even if they're taller and shorter, if they're going at the same speed. They don't know that. And they don't. You can see it, though. Now, they're, they're all kind of independent. But the parents who come to Columbia on the final week, they're never in staff. Right? So this is on Wabash when the sun is on the other side. I got to go up, not on Michigan Avenue, but on Wabash. And there's the parents kind of going from class to class. I love this picture. Look at those heels, huh? I mean, you just don't see this. And the heels and the guys foot here. I mean, it's just girl. Now, you got to take a lot of these pictures. It'll all work out. <laughs> Across the street, Jones High School has a track team. Now, talk about being in strike. These are the two fastest guys on the team. I could tell by watching. Uh, and so they're going at exactly the same speed. They're like those businessmen. Bang, 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 bang. They're not racing each other. They're pacing each other. I said, what is from here? They're sharing a leg, too. <laughs> See this? So this is something I've never seen, you know? I said, you learn in photography because photography is the total result of the picture. It's all digital. So it's not like drawing where uh, you might be wandering and trying to think, or you know, when you're writing something, you say, I'll find the end to this essay. Oh, that's what I'm doing. You know, my tip is write the end first, start wherever you want, connect. You know, nobody does it. But uh, so I thought, God, I. I I'm onto something here. It, I will admit, and some other people have said it to me privately, great photographers do. Sometimes you take a picture that's better than you. And you say, that's mine? I own the scan. How do they take that? Well, sometimes, you, you, to be honest, you can't see everything going that fast. So that's why it's good to see the result. And now you can see it. In my old day, when I went to the Darkroom, where the art history Darkroom and developed the thing, I thought, okay, that was a day, six hours later, a day, a week later. Well, you can learn, but it's slower. So now you just look at the screen. Now the screen is, but when you get it bigger and still works, you brag about it. <laughs> <laughs> so I go out on the uh, uh, lakefront trail a lot. I'm a cyclist, I build bikes. Uh, and I was going to do a whole theme on cycling, which I kind of started as a theme. And I thought, no, I'm just, I'm going for um, the light. I got to stay on the, the, the idea of the light. It's the primary thing about the photography. Well, now I see people are walking in stride. So I add that to the light. And I've got shadows and this beautiful, beautiful sculpture that's going on uh, is there. And then I just can't stop and get this picture. And right away, I didn't think anything about it until I get it bigger. And I said, ponytails. Who would they? The ponytails are such a factor in making the picture anything at all. Mostly women. Okay. All right. Then one day it rained heavily, and there was a reflecting pool. And so I thought, oh, God, I'm going to get this camera. It's really small. It's only this big. This is the one. Take all these pictures. Of it. And it's a professional point and shoot, 800 bucks. So I get the tree, you know, and I get it like, this is what I call a set trap. You just stay there. You know what? An event happened. Because photography is also about timing. I'm not really photographing the subject yet, right? Although. Come on, that's good. Huh? This guy comes down. I don't even see the tights. I said, when he gets his foot right there, I'm ready. And plop. So I get home, and I take, I don't know, 50 or 100 that day. And I look at it, and I said, I didn't see that. I didn't see those tights. It's going to bite your You know, it's what we call a gift. I said, it's happening over and over again. So I said, that, you know, the reflection that was natural See what I get. Well, then the next day I go right back there. All the water's gone, and it's like foggy. Like, no, this is not the light thing. I said. So then I said, what does the lighting situation allow you to do? 
Most people just want to, they just deal with the subject. You know, journalists have to do it. You go, you go whatever it is, you, do, you take it. Do the best. I said, it's good for portraits. So, because if everything is crystal and clear, the tree is as emphasized so much in, in sharpness as her face, and it gets lost. It happens all the time. You don't even think of it. Because you were looking at your friend, and you photographed him or her, and then when you get it, it's great because they're smiling, and then everything is coming out of their hair and stuff like that. And who's that photobombing in the background? You don't want to get photobombed by a tree like that. That's pretty. That's a good tree. Well, and look, they're beautiful. They're just uh, so I know. Well, but I'm not going to rely on fog. I don't have a lot, so I get rid of that. So then I find this little spot that I've been going by uh, up about. Three trees on the path north of the 51st Street overpass. And it's got a big puddle in there because it's a big hole that the Park District truck had dug out somehow because it got stuck and made it deep. And I have my camera. This was a, a bigger camera. Um, and I get there. And I said, Oh, I get the pool. I get the water. I'll just, and the light is beautiful. And if you can see them, there are three dragonflies in there. That's a, that's a sharp lens. So I'm shooting at two thousandths of a second, so they're ice, you know, they're frozen. That's when we had that infection of uh, bugs. And at one time, if they're not in focus, they look like spots, and I had to kind of spot them out. So here's this uh, jogger, really trim, and you know, she knows what she's doing here. So I got it. So I got it set where the limbs are coming in, pointing to said, "I want something in the middle of this picture, please. Come on, right?" So I said, okay, I'll time it so people are in the middle. And no matter what, stride they're in. Because I'm only shooting one at a time. And then, bingo. This woman shows up. I said, she's commanding the picture. She did not have to be in the middle. Lady, you just do what you want because this is terrific. But look, it, her face is darkened out. There's a... There's a <laughs> a line emphasizing her posterior from her arm. One hand is in the light, one hand is dark. I mean, all these things are working out. I said, I'm not that good. No, I just said, but look how it's lined up. Uh, look at the tree limbs, right? I'm dead in the middle. I'm not moving the camera. I said, this is it. I'm sticking here. So I get up really early the next morning, this in the afternoon, and I said, is it going to work then? Venus goes up, you know. I'm like, oh my god, and I've got the axles right on the horizon. I said, how am I doing this? So um, I said, I got, I'm not giving the spot up. You know? uh, and then the next thing that shows up, um, water bottles. Water bottles. Who does water bottles? I'm already the best water bottle photographer. <laughs> Because, you know, I don't have that gorgeous uh, belt of Venus before sunrise <laughs> luminosity, but it's coming through the bottle. And the clouds, though they're heavy, it's lighter, lighter than everything else, so you get this uh, silhouette. Every time you do this with your cell phone camera, because you yeah. can't control the shutter speed aperture part. It'll generalize and take a really good picture. The clouds will all be... Uh, you know, blast it out. The kid will be identifiable, uh, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, if you do more, if you don't do two thousandths of a second, you don't stop the spokes. All right? So he wasn't going that fast. Anyway, so that's, and the clouds come back. And, oh, here comes a guy on skis. I, I said, oh, come on, this is. So I do need the subjects, but I'm not there to do the subjects. I'm there to do the luminosity. So I'm thinking, what well, is that's the basic thing. Well, you gotta you gotta have an event. You need time. I, I'm been a journalist kind of photographer, street photographer, so I, I gotta have the time. So that's fine. I get the time. I get good at getting them in the middle, stopping them. Sometimes they're perfect. Sometimes they're awkward. Even when the later in the fall in the evening, sometimes there's no big sun coming over the horizon. You get a gift too. I mean, she doesn't even have to have the pony gift coming out in this case. Your colors. 
So it's a calendar kind of event, calorifically. Uh, and then the beautiful dog shows up. I have been seeing this dog all this time. And I said, I want that dog to run right into my studio. I call it my studio. And I said, I'm going to sit here. Well, this, I don't know this woman, but she's kind of, she's very friendly to me now because she's seen the pictures on High Park Classic. I post some of them there. I thought, this is the happiest dog in the world. Okay? <laughs> this woman is like a marathon runner, so she's serious. If she's going north, it takes a good 40 minutes from her to come back at this speed. And because she does that, she stays on the trail. And because she does that, she gets in the studio. Otherwise, they're down close to the lake in the grass for God like me. And I can't get them. So this happens, and uh, eventually I, I say, does anybody know who this one? Oh, it looks like somebody in my building. So they <coughs> alert her to these pictures, and I, she doesn't contact me, but she sees them. Because now she'll, she'll, she'll wait. <laughs> but look at this. If you keep at it, now this is, you know, later. The ponytails and the dog tail. <laughs> <laughs> so how right? Where do you get this stuff? I said, like, what? You just got to sit there. You know, it comes to you. Uh, here she is in the less of the profile. I thought, yeah, I don't know. But look, you know, the face of the Indian, the hair, the nice shadow. You got to work. You got to work with the light. Um, this is not that dog. This is another really good dog. I have never seen this dog again. I want this dog to come back. <laughs> really early hair. I got it in dead sharp focus. It's hard to focus this situation because if you focus on the far trees or the horizon, that's out there. If you focus up here, it's really close. Um, and there's nothing in the picture before they arrive to focus on. And with automatic camera, this is troublesome. So I've been dealing with that. Don't listen to what I say on it when I'm doing it out there. <laughs> but I also get the giant schnauzer. Uh, I finally asked her, I said, what is that dog? She said, it's a giant schnauzer. <laughs> oh. But they, she's also a very active writer. And that dog looks a little bit bigger than it compared to her because of the wide-angle lens. If you know with wide-angle lenses, things in the front are a little bit normally bigger than our, our normal vision. All right, so I go out in the snow. Sometimes it's just shoes. Everybody's got these fluorescent shoes now, right? And somebody said, you could make money <laughs> with Nike or whoever does these shoes. Is that Nike? Yeah, it's a swoosh. <laughs> Maybe. Well, now I start learning other things. I said shoelaces are really important. They show up because they flop up and down. If you can focus. Now, I love this idea that people, uh, you can't quite figure out now the two biggest shoes are closer. Okay. But try to think of the two forward legs as one guy, and then the other guy is kind of flying like an angel. I go, this is really good. I've never seen a picture like this. So this is what you do. At Columbia, the professors are always saying, work begets work. Just keep going. The pictures will help you. You know, you know? I said, yeah, well, I'm, I'm having a great time out here. You know, I went out for the light. What kind of picture does that light permit you to do? Silhouettes, one thing. And then you find out the silhouettes with the two people. How do you know who's who? And then, who, who, who thought this up? You know. Now this one, I love it. Well, it's very dark and gloomy. So that little white spot that's like a halo type of thing, that was kind of creeping across the sky right in the middle of my studio. And, it's, and there's hardly anybody out there. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a wasted little spot of light. And then, bingo, right there. <laughs> what what Cartier Rousseau in 1952 called the decisive moment. Uh, now, he hated that. I knew him very, very well. Because my best friend in Paris was his niece. That's how I got to know him really well. And it can be him a buzzword. And more characteristic of him is to catch light in the act of living. Uh, uh, so before that time, in 1930, they tried to call that the good moment, the little moment, or the ephemeral truth. That was good. 
No. But so, how did I take this picture? What do you think it did? It's up. Somebody just walking there. So if they miss their stride or something, I miss the picture. But then you have to add that. So um, this helps explain this creature. Huh? Yeah. There's two people there. There might be three. <laughs> Somebody has their hands down. I love this thing. This jazz. Yeah. <laughs> now here are three uh, lady, young ladies uh, with their drinks and the handbag. This is a gift to her. She's stepping right into a little puddle of light. And then they each got there something in front of their grapes and their bag. And this is where, where do these pictures come from? So um, then I said, I gotta get out of the spot. I can't spend my whole life sitting down there in the mud. So I moved, I, I, I moved like uh, 50 yards south. <laughs> uh, and the sun's coming up. And I said, oh, the sun is coming up. It's, it's a different thing. You see, I'm hiding it behind that tree, but the sun's getting around. And I watched this guy go through in, in, in snare and in branches. Like, oh, that's pretty good. Now, a month later, I saw a guy stand there for 30 minutes in that spot at sunrise. I said, you must have seen it. Mm-hmm. Or, I agree, people discover the same thing all the time. But, and he didn't come back, so. Now, this is interesting here. Uh, so I'm moving around a little bit, not too far from where I am. And this is a, an older guy who's still out there, probably this morning, I didn't go out this morning, who, who, who jogs as slow as possible for about an hour. He's the oldest guy out there, I think. Anyway, I get him, he's going so slow that he just emerges from this tree. Uh, uh, but I had taken earlier this one. I thought, oh, this is interesting. Later, the famous author said, I want to use this as an illustration for my friend's essay, or I sent it to her. They're both feminist writers. Uh, Rebecca Solnit is one of them, if you know her. She has a hundred books. Um, because it was about a, a forest, a water sp- a spirit called the Laume, I think, in Lithuania. And Latvians have this kind of thing. And it's about a, a murder and a woman gets slaughtered. And, you know, and she's pissed at her brothers that kill her. And she so, turns her daughters into trees. And so in Lithuania, and uh, a lot of women are named after trees. <coughs> I don't know if anyone's named Box Elder or anything like that, but you know, I mean, Laurel, all kind of things. Um, and I thought, oh, really? And she said, can I share this? I'm going to send it to her. And I said, yeah, sure, maybe, maybe it'll be in a book. Uh, but I'm invented a picture, you know. Uh, and if you were to give a, that assignment to a photographer to say, well, I want you to illustrate the water sprite, the spirit, well, well, we'll figure something out. Yeah. And we'll get to this idea. So when the sun comes up, then you can do silhouettes still. But it's almost begging you to do the faces coming into the sun. So here I've got one guy who says hi to me every day. Now, happily, there's more of a picture than just hi David, how do you know? Mm-hmm. You know and, but you can start to see uh, faces. So this is a different thing, photographing in the public, where the face shows. Exactly. Um, and then the other thing is when they're coming along the path into the rising sun, you see this skyline, this right. Uh, but you also see um, 
these tree shadows, the trunk shadow going diagonally there. Now you get a shadow on the fence. Then you get this woman, her face is just partly edited. And one foot is in and one foot is out. Also, big deal for Johnny, the bottoms of the shoes are colored. <laughs> and it just takes over. You know, I didn't know that. Well, when I was their age, they didn't have that. Here's two kids from New High. Now you can get, if you get it just right, the guy gets his uh, shadow on the, on the trunk. Right? So if, <clears throat> as my students say, street photography where people's faces show and all, they call them creepers because creepy guys take them. Thank you for the thought. That didn't show up in the 60s. Uh, but this, I mean, you can't not take this picture. It's gorgeous. Or even better. I got the shadows of the tree. I'm on a roll here. So, um, but if you're there, you're suspicious. And I'm standing there like this for like eight minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, taking pictures of people. I, they don't know what I'm doing. But mostly they think uh, the other, the studio part, I'm doing the sky. Well, I have a lot of sky pictures. You know, I don't know, but it, I'm taking them. And that's wonderful. I've only met him once. This wonderful homeless guy who only speaks some kind of Spanish is showing me that he says, I, he's talking to me, but I don't understand anything. He's like, oh, see, you're doing this on. You know, I, he, he knows. He's aware of this. Everybody else who's jogging and running is in their own world, which is great for photography. For, because you get, don't get the camera face, you know, unless they wait. So I'm looking down the path when the, they're looking into the sun, and I think, oh man, this is golden. You know, I got my, and now I have my little uh, uh, trap set. It's on. I'm leaning against a tree and trying to get everything lined up. And I turn around and boom! They said, oh, that's what's behind me all the time. Yeah. So it's, oh no, this is a harder picture to take. Because you got to get this person the right size, you got to get a, 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 a silhouette, a ponytail, always helps. Uh, you got to get that sun from streaming in your lens. Um, uh, you know, it's generous out there. The subject is very much generous. Uh, but you know, uh, half the times I wake up and I only see the top half of the sky out of my window at home, I said, ah, no, no, no. And it's, not, it's nothing out there. I said, you can't say that. You can't say that until you come back. You know, I would have missed this. Yeah. You don't need any color. <laughs> well, there's a little color in there. And then the other thing I discover, other than like a super ponytail, <laughs> nobody's beating this thing, is the, the, the uh, foam on their sleeve so they can jog to and see, you know. It lights up. I have a very sensitive camera, so I get it. So I'm teaching myself. Now, here is the picture that everyone thinks I'm taking. But I like this picture because this is a red-tailed hawk coming in. And there are people in here. But with that lens, they're very tiny. Now, I do wish I had a telephoto for this hawk. He was there for about, I think it's the same one, for about a week or 10 days, and he migrated elsewhere. Uh, one of the people, I meet these people on the side, uh, on the cycle, on the lakefront trail. And uh, one of them is a, a bird expert. His name is uh, Raptor Hal. <laughs> and I said, I think I saw your peregrine falcon. He said, he lives in a building nearby. And then he walked down further the day. He has his camera, and he sent me this beautiful big picture of a red tail hog. He said, David, that's your bird. So I said, thank you. I don't know. <laughs> then I went up a little further by 39th Street. Late in the evening, if you would see the original scan, it's much, much darker, so to lighten some of this up. Then you get these, like, Maxfield Parish pictures behind him. It's a kid on the skateboard with a cell phone, of course. It's just, I know. I had a place for the cameras to get set up. I, I put it on a little tiny tripod and I waited. There are three pathways uh, going south in this case. 
So I get one third the number of people, which, you know, you need a lot the way I work. Yeah. Sometimes it's just the event of a, a the storm blowing in. And you get that. So you're, I'm looking at the light, and then I, I have to have somebody in the picture. So I edit out bad ones. <laughs> but this is, did a lot of this. Then there's this guy. This enchanted me for so long because if you look up at his head, he's got like the profile of uh, Alfred Hitchcock. <laughs> I said, I can never do that again. I said, this is, you can't, you don't see that when you pay it. I said, I love this picture now. I used to think, oh, it's too vacant somewhere else. I was going to forget it. <laughs> uh, so I'm learning this stuff. Um, so I also uh, do exhibits at the Environmental Law and Policy Center, and we do things about environments and uh, conservation and things like that. And I want to do one on how we share bike path. Um, and so I'm looking, and it's a totally overcast day, no dynamics in the luminosity. And I said, well, I got my bike here. I'll film it out. I said, this is too artificial. And then I take people running through. And then, then again, if you think of that one guy as his two legs going backwards, he's stuck on a rim. And, and then my student, I post these on my own, some of them on my own Facebook page, and my students go wild, and they make it spin around, and they do a man ray thing on it, and oh gosh, it doesn't go like that. But there's this lady, I haven't seen her recently, who always runs like this. But look at she pulling the sun out of the horizon there. It's just fantastic. She always jogs like this. She's so happy. I thought, I'm never confronted with this. Is, this lady's got something going here. Uh, so the, um, there were people who complained that said, what are you doing? These creepy pictures. I don't know. God. And we got into a long yeah, argument about it. And you know, it, I understand it. There were people who stalk people. There are battered people in, in relationships, or there's people who have restraining orders against people who are looking for them. Uh, they're mostly women, and I understand this problem. So, and then we get into the male gaze, and I, I, I can't win that argument. You, you know, you're already guilty, all right? But the, the like uh, point swimmers, the point swimmers, they invite me to come and photograph them. I said, I don't know, they're, your little head's in the water, it's not gonna be much. So I get there, and they, Look at this. This is gorgeous. This is my first time there. Perfect. Ah, she's blessing the water. I don't know what she's doing. I, I think, my God, this is fantastic. But I'm ready with the silhouette idea. You see? So I said, well, yeah, that's what's going on. Nobody's in the water yet. Uh, and then when they get in there, it'll be so tiny. Then I take this picture. <laughs> oh, my God. But it's really this picture. You know, come on, guys. It looks like two people holding something. I don't know. What. And it's this. I like to show the whole thing because that first one is contained in here. But sometimes you need to see inside, especially in a portrait. You need to see the eyes first, but you always see everything else. So these are kind of recent ones. Uh, you see the snow and the ice. Again, here's a, here's a couple who come out every day, and they're almost always running stride. But now he's getting they're, they just started to run, so they're not quite in stride. And he's already off the ground. He's very energetic. She'll catch up the morning. Ah, there's a devil dog, an off leash dog. Oh, this dog never is on the path. Uh, now that it's all salty, he and his own, his own is right behind him. He lo loves to let it run wild, and he never bothers me. I'm down at muzzle level, remember. There's a couple dogs that came close, <laughs> what do you say? But they were on leashes. And so there, it almost looks like the, 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 the hind leg is up from the salt, but there's a whole series of him going across. He's really a stealthy little dog. Um, and then this, there are these Dalmatians that come out. And twice a day, every day. Uh, they don't always come out all the way to the lake in this frigid weather. Uh, but I love this one. It was very dark and dull, 
and I lightened it up uh, selectively, and it pops out just right like that. So yesterday I did this one for you guys. I went out there, I froze to death, <laughs> and I had nobody's here. I'm sitting there for 20 minutes, and nobody's coming. And then a cross-country team comes by. <laughs> so look at this light. And it's gorgeous. And she said, oh, thank you. You know. And I got another, uh, these were all men, there were women. And at that time, I set the camera back down, and you see that pile of snow, then they automatically focused on the snow, and they were out of focus. I earned it. But I did give you a uh, little self-portrait. Here I am, behind uh, two of my subjects. This woman is a photographer, too. I don't know her. But I saw her unpack that bag. She has some serious equipment in there. <laughs> Mine's down in the snow, you know. And it's got a, a remote. Uh, you can do it by timing, or there's a Wi-Fi connection. So I thought, you know, if people aren't going to come out there, maybe I'm going to do these boring self-portraits. But unfortunately, my subjects always say me. So that's what I'm doing out there. Uh, it's fun. And I, I made real progress, I think, you know. As I said, how did you teach yourself to take a picture you didn't know existed? You had to do it. But the camera teaches you back because you see the picture done. My mentor used to say, um, a young photographer would come in and say, I want you to critique my photographs. And he said, well, if you were drawing and were in the studio and you had a model or something, you know, I could see how you're doing. And the photographs is too late. <laughs> you know, it's gone. You're already finished. And he said, well, I want to hear it. He said, well, if it's not good, what can you do? <coughs> well, next picture. But these pictures never come back. You have to just keep them out. Now, when you know that your laces and water bottles and ponytails are important, you can look for them, and then you can see what else goes on when you finally get a lot of them. So that's it. You guys had a fantastic display. <laughs> They're really better than projection. Oh, I, I was all worried about it. I was going to be this big. So, do you have any questions Quick about questions. this? Yeah. Do the photography students at Columbia have to take um, film and paper? Uh, they Now, uh, the main Photo 142 courses are digital because... No, no, I... Because they do teach darkroom, chemical wet dark, uh, wet dark. Uh, it's more and more a niche idea. They still have to learn how to do the thing manually and not on program. But what happens uh, is also a business decision. We get people from art and design. We get people from fashion. We get people from editorial. We get people, all these people who will not need to make prints ever. And that, oh, so we doubled the number of courses we teach. That was good for the school, because now they're full of non-photo majors. They may even have one for non-photo majors. Because, you know, I have prints of some of these that I will show at some point. Um, and that's, I still enjoy to do it. But I know photographers, I said, well, that's only got 12 megabytes. You know, how are you going to make prints? And they said, why would I make prints? <laughs> it's all going right to a magazine. So it's a different world there. But you can manipulate these saturation, density, darker, lighter, all kinds of things, much more than you can uh, chemically. Yeah, the, the, that one of the Dalmatian, that, that was very intricate dodging and burning only, just lighting the thing up and making the dog go. I said, okay, now that picture is worth When I first saw that picture, I said, I, I got nothing for today. I said, okay, this, the best thing I got, because the, the feet were, you know, framing the dog's feet. I said, okay, that's right. Well, let's work on it. And then when, once the dog popped out, I said, oh, that's, that's the picture. So sometimes you know what the picture is. So, was how, um, so just how early did you go out there? And uh, when the sun comes in the summer, it's not for me, you know. In the summer, it's, you know, before 6. Uh, now it's about 7.20, 7.12, maybe. Uh, but you want to get there before, uh, usually. 
But now, if it's cold, like today, I didn't go out. I was doing this for you. It's really cold. <laughs> Your battery gets weak in the cold. All kinds of things go wrong. The, 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 the camera still works. But um, when there's not many people there, you just take a picture of the sky, which I was not my purpose. I want an event. So, yeah. Do you go every day? And when did you start? Well, I haven't gone out there every day. When it, when it was more comfortable and was really on a roll, I would go four times a week, sometimes both evening and So that's uh, four hours at least. you got to put the time in. Uh, there's a moment there where you, you think you're not getting anything new, and then you're, you, there's a little panic. Uh, it's not really a panic. It's a searching. You're kind of, you're not really lost. But that's the time when you're available to look for something else. With the, with the parameters you've set, it's got to be stop light, it's got to be about, uh, there's got to be a timing element, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and sometimes you can't find it or you move to a different spot and say, okay, I'm going to cultivate this spot. Sometimes it'll take a week to figure out where to put the camera. Um, because you want them to be kind of silhouetted or profiled uh, often. I mean, there's a lot of demands after a while from your successful pictures. Because um, I can take lots of good pictures. Uh, believe me, if I'm given an assignment, I can get uh, people's faces right, and so you can see. But you know, it's a cluster of things behind them. And, you know, that's not that ideal. But I'm looking to invent a new picture. Um, so once you get really good at it, you keep doing the same thing over and over again. And that's what we try to keep our kids. Like, okay, you got to break that up. You, get, you can't keep doing what you're good at. You got to, you, you're at school. This is time to make mistakes. But since I'm not working for anything, if I fail, I just fault myself and say, okay, next. Always go out. I, I could try only probably 10 times that I ever come back with almost nothing. Sometimes I come back and say, I didn't know it was going to be here. Yeah, you, you can't know. So, so yeah. Um, in shifting your focus from isolated subjects to luminosity, do you think of yourself as working within a particular tradition or tradition? Well, there's no tradition here, because I'm a historian of photography of long, <laughs> long in the tooth. And I know there are no pictures like this. So it's hard to say there's a tradition. Uh, I've written about the beginnings of uh, what you would call the decisive moment, which I call uh, a set trap. Because Kertes in 1926 had two or three pictures where he's standing on the steps of Montmartre, looking down at the shadows and the railings and everything, and he's waiting for something to happen down on the street level. And there's two or three pictures, and one's a zinger. And I, I, you can tell from mentioning the shadow lady, he's there 15 minutes. Now, they, they're not all identically shot like my little studio, but I can read it. So he's, he's there, and he has a camera that's fairly small portable, uh, but it's not a Leica yet. You can't advance to the next frame. You've got to put another little glass plate in. So he sees the opportunity, and then he waits, like me. And then he gets it, like that. And he waits and waits and then eventually they become very fluid to do that. They do it and the camera moves and you know, and then with the Leica there was a film advance, it was the first a nod that you turn. So you had 36 exposures in there. Really good lens to focus it. <laughs> um, and Carter Grisson had a way to go with the camera and wind it like that. You know, that that risks throwing a really expensive camera on the ground. But he used a roof strap. Um, and so you can follow some action and get the things like I did. Now, with 4%, I just like a minute to the movie. So that's better for us. But I plug up a lot of external hard drives with hundreds of thousands of pictures <laughs> that are useless because of either side, what I was after. So that would be the, the genre street photography or stop action. But, as I said, I entered it from the luminosity part. If you read all of what uh, Dresselin wrote, he doesn't talk about light hardly at all. Uh, because, you know, it's not going to, in any way, be a factor for him. But with uh, 
William Cliff, one of the great landscape photographers, is all about how light lays on in the mix of the landscape. You know, it's like where it says, you've got to be able to just lay down and look up for an hour and think that it's kind of well spent. And I'll have that. Oh, they're romantics. <laughs> Did you have a question I could do? One more. one more question. Yeah. And then well, I have been a huge fan of your work when you were curating all the. Oh my God! You go back. <laughs> no, I didn't have any idea you were a photographer, um, and I, you speak so passionately about this. I just want to ask, why do you do what you do? I mean, some photographers are obsessive, some yeah. are searching. Why? Why are you embarking on this kind of quest? Well, I I don't know. Uh, I mean, I always had. Uh, that what um, uh, called one of those intelligences, you know, I have good mathematical intelligence because I came here as a mathematician, but I have a spatial, I can see the uh, uh, pattern of the picture. So that was made my photography entry easier. Um, but I got into history of photography uh, because, of, you know, I mean, freelance is tough <laughs> when you get out of school, you have no connection. Uh, and I got a job right away. They, they had no business hiring someone my age. But you couldn't take any courses. Yeah, so everything was self-taught. I studied with Joel Snyder, who just about to retire from here. Um, but I always had this passion for taking it. And then when I was a curator, I really can't compete with Brassai, Kertes, Carter Bersong, Richard Avedon, uh, Irving Patton, who's our best we now have. I mean, these guys are something else. They change the way people speak. Uh, and I was glad, you know, but I mean, I need 10,000 people on my level. <laughs> so you don't want to compete. And he said, yeah, I'll free myself up uh, and do it now. So I, I don't know, so far so good. Thank you for asking that question. <laughs> oh, oops, I don't know. Well, I'll be brief. OK, be brief. I have to be last. <laughs> okay, so you mentioned that most of the people who are passing on the trail think that you're photographing the horizon, and that some of the women have come up to you and said that they're not going to look at it. And yeah, the students in your I get class, both kinds. But. Okay, and that the students in your class call them creeper photos. Why doesn't that bother you? It does bother me, because I'm trying to be empathetic, and there's been a long back and forth trolling and stuff like that about you know people who won't let go of that idea and you don't have any business doing that you're being rude you don't have the right to do that i said no if you look up the american civil liberties union right. page, it's legal. it it's says legal. you can only uh, make a case for privacy if there was an expectation of privacy and a public part has to do that i don't want to be an able about it but that's why i post some of so people can see what I'm up to. Right? Photographers have always been suspicious. Now, there are two great scandals in our age, other than politics. <laughs> one is Catholic priests. The other one is police. One of them involves only photography that's revealed it. So should we say these people have no business not minding the police when they say, get out of here and get rid of that camera? Those are very great people because the police have acted with impunity until video recording with cell phones. And now we have a mayor that no one's likes exactly because of those dash cams and things like that. So I don't take that position that I'm doing that service to uh, society. But if you're not signed up to have arts in your society, it's it's not worth living. So I take that position that I should be doing this. Almost there are only four people that have ever objected. The one woman that came up and used up all my good light time <laughs> later saw the pictures and she came up and then apologized effusively. She said, "I'm an artist too." One of the people on the list, sir, offered me a, an exhibition, so they have backpedaled when you see it. But I said. Okay, you post it, then there's an objection. There's your broadcast. If you don't post it, everybody thinks the worst of it. So I, 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 nobody takes pictures to keep them safe. So that's what I do. I also say that in the course of a day, you'll probably photograph 
15 times that you don't know. And those pictures are controlled by nobody you know, nobody who stands out there that you can talk to, and there's very little security on those pictures. Notice Target got hacked, the government got hacked by China. I mean, who's taking all those pictures of you? Oh, security cameras, we have to have them. And then we have no idea first they're taken, and who's, who has them, and how they could use them. So I feel more innocent. But, but I do understand that I can't feel the way a woman on that bike path feels if they're jogging along. I can't. I've been robbed out there when I was a student in the devil time, wasn't And some of them said they've been robbed too. Uh, I know one woman long, long ago who was raped. And then, uh, those are issues I have to, that aren't in my bloodstream. But I, sh- I have to be polite and respectful of them. But what can you do? I mean, you can't have security 100%. So this idea that now we know about pedophilia more, now we know about people stalking a curse. So that all gets dumped on the suspicious person. So it's an issue. So if you, I show them because I want people to know. That couple, that beautiful couple looking at each other with a shadow, I mean, I'm not going to take that picture because their faces are showing. Uh-huh. Not me. I'm, I'm that person. Okay. There are other people out there, I believe. Sorry. Well, okay. I'd like to thank you, David, for being our oh, guest sure. today. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say, I found out about David's work through the through a Hyde Park list where people yeah, were so, discussing so the random person out on the yeah. Lakeshore Path taking photographs, and I thought it was such an interesting uh, question here in Hyde Park, where we're really a small community, yeah. to, well, so I wanted to see what you were doing. And I'd yeah. like to know, is there a way that we can see more of your photographs? Is there going to be an exhibition that we should know about? Well, there will probably be an exhibition sometime. My son did a little board book once for Christmas. Some of the pictures he But he did a beautiful job, and I'm like, well, we'll see. We'll see, because they, they got, they're going to be somewhere. I put them on my Facebook page. Um, uh, well, and then I also put on the page what I'm thinking about in many of the pictures, what happened, and people like that. They say, oh, oh well, this is teaching me. Mm-hmm. I said, well, I'm learning. I'm teaching myself, so that's fine. But, but it's true. Uh, photographs are still a very, very powerful thing. So uh, when there is the next exhibition, you'll let me know. Oh, I'll let everybody know. Yes. Oh, I would love it. Um, I'm proud that there might be one down at the environmental law and policy center. We might do a two-person show there with the lakefront idea. I don't know. Sure. That would be good. Thank you. Thank okay. You. Thank you.